It's been pretty obvious for over two months that the mental health issues arising from the absurd and unnecessary global lockdown and social distancing policies will be unprecedented. There will be twin genuine pandemics of anxiety and depression. It's also been clear from the start that the medical profession will be quite incapable of dealing with the massive demand for help. The response of doctors will inevitably be to prescribe drugs such as tranquilizers, sedatives, hypnotics and antidepressants, which will do little or nothing to help the patients for whom they are prescribed, but which will, I fear, produce a mass of dangerous side effects, including addiction and an increased risk of suicide. So far, so bad, but it gets worse. I've been studying the effect of stress on human beings for nearly 50 years. My book, Stress Control, now long out of print, was published in 1978 and was the first mass market book to introduce the concept of stress as a factor in mental and physical health. At the time, it was considered heretical and controversial to regard stress as having any influence at all and one professor of medicine called for me to be struck off the medical register for daring to suggest that stress might have an effect on blood pressure. As the days and weeks of this manufactured fake crisis have passed by, I've become increasingly convinced that what's happening is not a result of a combination of misjudgment, misfortune and incompetence, but a result of manipulation and oppression, and the stress produced has reached unprecedented levels. I didn't come to this conclusion lightly. Whenever things go badly wrong, it's always more likely to be a result of incompetence than a, of a conspiracy in high places. But the evidence in favour of a conspiracy is now irresistible. Right from the start, it's been clear that the coronavirus was not a new plague. Back in March of 2020, the UK's public health bodies concluded that the coronavirus was not a, open quotes, high consequence infectious disease, close quotes. And yet, just days after this reassurance, the UK government introduced the most tyrannical bill ever passed by a British parliament. The 358-page emergency bill, which gave them the power to introduce the lockdowns and social distancing and what have you, and took us back to pre-Magna Carta days. King John himself would have been proud of Boris Johnson's ruthless and unnecessary power grab. Unfortunately, we don't have a King Richard to ride to our rescue. Not even during the Black Death Plague was so much power taken from the people. Our civil rights have disappeared and there's no sign of them returning. It's no exaggeration that now, around the world, many people live in police states. Everything I've written and said so far has been proved right. Experts now agree that we should have done far more testing back in March of 2020 and that Ferguson, the mathematical modeler whose theories helped decide government policy, has probably mistakenly exaggerated the risks. I'm by no means the only person to realise, or rather to think, that Ferguson's track record is appalling. His predictions seem to me to be a about on a par with those of a fortune teller using an upturned goldfish bowl. Ferguson's initial claim that 500,000 Britons would die of the coronavirus is still being quoted, even though the estimate has been rather discredited and the modelling questioned, to put it politely. Much fuss is made of the fact that 300,000 people are alleged to have died around the world, though I doubt if many doctors would believe this figure, there's little doubt that it's wildly exaggerated. And although every one of those deaths is a tragedy, the figure has to be put against the figure of 650,000, over twice as much, which is the number who can die of flu in a single season. Malaria kills over 600,000 a year without anyone turning a hair, and tuberculosis recently killed one and a half million people in a single year. I don't remember councils rushing around taping up park benches and banning people from driving to parks to protect us from that danger.
the UK government's appalling record on testing puts it in 41st place in the world, far behind Lithuania, Luxembourg and Cyprus. Several studies have suggested that a huge percentage of the population has already had the virus and that those people are therefore now immune. The minister responsible for this failure should be looking for employment elsewhere. There's also widespread medical support for my contention that the lockdown was not only unnecessary and counterproductive in controlling the infection, but also guaranteed to cause far more deaths and mayhem than the virus itself. Every day that passes produces yet more evidence that every forecast I made is coming true. Sadly and rather worryingly, such views are, however, frequently suppressed or mocked in the mainstream media and regarded as being some sort of conspiracy theory. YouTube banned three videos of mine, which as far as I can see broke none of its guidelines, though to be fair they did put one of the videos back up, the video in which I criticised YouTube for taking down the other two videos. I can only see two possible conclusions from all this. The first is that the politicians and the government's scientific medical advisers are all incredibly stupid and I'm brilliant. The second conclusion is that there's been a conspiracy to exaggerate the danger of the coronavirus in order to grab power and damage our rights and freedoms. I can't see any other explanations. Now, as much as I'd like to accept the first conclusion, I'm old enough and realistic enough to know that it's not very likely. The second conclusion is far more likely. And once we accept that there's a conspiracy, then all bets are off and we have to re-examine everything that's happening. And this takes us back to mental health and the coming twin pandemics of anxiety and depression, which are going to do infinitely more harm than a pesky virus, which has done provably less damage than some flu bugs. And it quickly becomes apparent that governments have done everything possible to create more anxiety and to exacerbate the incidence of depression. Everything the government in the UK has done, for example, has been designed to create loneliness and a sense of fear. The lockdowns and absurd social distancing policies were never necessary, but they're now destined to be part of our lives indefinitely. The threat that lockdowns will be introduced will be kept hovering over our heads and we're told that social distancing policies must be maintained indefinitely in case this well-marketed brand of the flu reappears. When the lockdown rules were slightly relaxed in England on the 20th of May, a government minister told the world that a son could meet his elderly parents if he met his father in the morning and his mother in the afternoon, but not together. And the meeting should take place out of doors and the particip participants should keep six feet apart. What the devil would they advise if the plague came back full time? Incidentally, why must people keep six feet apart? In some countries, the required distance is three feet or four and a half feet. If social distancing were based on pure science, then people would have to keep at least 24 feet apart because that's the distance that a cough or a sneeze might send an infection. And so, all things considered, the fear will be maintained. The screw will be kept tightly turned. Millions are already so terrified that they hardly dare leave their homes. It's a bizarre new variation of cabin fever. Closing hospitals, GP surgeries, dental surgeries and so on has added a new fear. Those who are already ill are suffering agonies as they wait for treatment. Those who are not ill are terrified that help won't be available if they need it. Around the world, 28 million, 28 million surgical operations have already been cancelled or postponed. That's 28 million real people and their families whose lives have been dangerously disrupted. Every week that the disruption lasts results in another 2.4 million cancellations. Why do those people not matter? The UK has built 10 brand new, huge and expensive hospitals for dealing with the coronavirus. Only two have ever been used. The NHS has 100,000 acute medical beds. 
Around 40,000 of those lie empty as I speak. The number of people visiting A&E departments has fallen by more than half because people are terrified to leave their homes, even they, if they need medical attention. You can see the effect of the social distancing policies if you walk down the street or enter one of the few shops allowed to open. Many people step aside with terror in their eyes. They cover their mouths and turn away. We're being taught to regard our neighbours as angels of death. We're creating a world in which enjoyment will soon be just a memory. I read somewhere that the coronavirus crisis will result in people being kinder to one another. I've rarely read such nonsense. This fake crisis will lead to ever more suspicions, fears, distrust, resentment and clinical anxiety. I've previously pointed out that school children, teenagers and people in their 20s will probably suffer most. Cruel school and college distancing policies will inevitably lead to generations of young people suffering serious psychological problems. We're breeding lonely, frightened people. Many will become very seriously mentally ill, dangerously withdrawn and unhinged. And all the time, politicians and advisers around the world are creating ever more fear by exaggerating the risks, by withdrawing promises and regularly contradicting one another so that confusion is created. We're told that there'll be no summer holidays, though if we behave ourselves, there might be a bank holiday extra in the autumn. There'll be no sporting events uh, except those on television. And so we're denied the chances of brightening our lives with events to, events to which we can look forward. No dinners, no celebrations, no big matches, no trips. In the unlikely event that hotels and restaurants survive the social distancing rules, visiting them will be about as much fun as root canal surgery. And just in case we allow ourselves a glimmer of hope for the future, we're quite accurately warned of massive tech tax rises to pay for all the chaos, shattered pensions, penury and joblessness lasting for decades. We're told that all this will be the result of the coronavirus. It won't. It'll be the result of the crisis created by governments unnecessarily. We're told that even if the virus goes away, it might return or mutate. There's much threatening, scary talk of the second wave. We're taught, taught we're warned quite bizarrely in my, few, in my view that we might be able to catch the disease more than once and so no one will ever be safe. How's that for creating scares? Curiously, however, it's said that magic vaccines will be prepared, prepared which will provide protection. We won't get any immunity from the disease, but the vaccine based on the disease will give us immunity. I, I wish someone would explain that to me. I've been studying vaccines for 50 years and I haven't got the foggiest idea how that's going to work. We've been told that a vaccine will be available within months, though it usually takes years to create a vaccine. And then we're told there won't be a vaccine. Why are they doing all this? They couldn't possibly have been as incompetent as they appear to be, so there has to be a reason. And the reason is power. We now live in a police state. All around the world people live in police states. We have no control over our lives. And power brings money. And it brings a menu of hidden agendas, population control, preservation of the oil supplies, replacing cash with plastic cards which can be regulated and controlled by people we can't see. And as, of course, as I predicted in my very first video back in the middle of March, demonising and marginalising the elderly. Thanks for watching an old man in a chair again. Apologies if I seem to get a bit angry. And thanks for all your support. This video has not been monetized. I've made no advertising uh, or any sponsorship associated with this or any of my videos. You can find more truths about the coronavirus and all sorts of other significant matters on my website, which also has no advertising and no sponsorship. 
Thank you very much again for all your encouragement and support. And thank you for watching.